right. Praise the Lord. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday night uh, Bible study first and then prayer that follows. Thank you, Facebook friends. It's always an honor having you join us through live streaming. We welcome you also. Let's, uh, let's stand on our feet if you're able and grab a hymn book in front of you and turn to page 301. Page 301 in your hymn book, Sweet Hour of Prayer. So let's sing that song. Think about the words because it is sweet hour of prayer. I think that's the best, sweetest hour of the day. It'll make your day sweeter. You don't spend time in sweet hour of prayer, your day will go sour. I want my day to be sweet. And the way to start that is spending time with the Lord in prayer. Sweet hour of prayer. Fellowship with the Lord in prayer. Isn't that exciting? We don't deserve that, but we have that opportunity to do it every single day, man. We have the access to spend time with God and be under the presence of God through prayer. Sweet hour of prayer. That's, that's pretty powerful. That's very inspiring. So page 301, sweet hour of prayer. is in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. So there in Ephesians, chapter 6, starting in verse 10, the word of the Lord reads, 
Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Amen. Please be seated. All right, we're going to continue our series about the believer's spiritual warfare. Tonight will be the last piece of armor. So let's just pray again. Let's pray, Father, bless this time. The most important part of the service, Lord, that we set aside for the teaching of the Word of God. Bless the Lord. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, is one of the pieces of armor, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you would just empower me and empower the word because there's, it has transforming power. Help Sister Muncie as she's also up there, Lord, trying to translate to Spanish, Lord. Fill her with your spirit. And Lord, use us both. And I pray that you will give us what we need, dear God. And we have the resources that we need to stand strong in this spiritual battle. We are on the winning side. We are... Uh, more than conquerors to him that love us. Uh, we are victors in Christ. We are winners in Christ. And Lord, uh, we don't have to lose the battle if we don't want because we have the whole armor of God. And I pray you will make me a blessing tonight. Help me to make sense. And Lord, and let this truth sink in. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're talking about the believer's spiritual warfare. We mentioned that to be rightly prepared, we must first recognize the enemy. The enemy is the devil. Ephesians 6, 11, put on the whole armor of God. You may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We mentioned, second, we must recognize the battle. Ephesians 6, 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual weakness in high places, so it is a spiritual warfare. Number three, we must recognize that we need his strength. And that's Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Number four, recognize that you need to put on the whole armor of God. He mentions that in Ephesians chapter 6. In verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. that You may be able to stand against the walls of the devil. And then he mentions it again in verse 13, the importance about the armor, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, and you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And then when we put on the whole armor of God, which is the, the seven pieces of armor, then we could recognize the victory. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, and in the power of his might, when we put on the whole armor, then you and I could stand victoriously. We could be able to stand against the walls of the devil and against the evil day. But what is the key? We must recognize the enemy, the devil. We must recognize that it's a spiritual warfare. We must recognize that we need his strength. We must put on the whole armor of God. And then we could claim the victory. So that's the key. It's just bottom shelf. 
And by the way, God will not put on the armor for us. That's personal responsibility. I have to put it on. You got to put it on and keep it on until you give your last breath. So first piece of armor that we studied was in verse 14. It says, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. So first was the bell of truth. Always be ready to live the truth and obey the truth. The second piece of armor is in verse 14, having on the breastplate of righteousness. So that is the bulletproof vest. That is keep living a righteous life. Always do right. No matter what, always do right in the sight of God. The third piece of armor that we study is in verse 15. And your feet shoved with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That means wearing the shoes of the gospel of peace. Always be ready. Sharing the gospel. We lost world because people are enemies of God. They are cut off from the life of God. They're separated from God. They're at war with God. And they need to be reconciled with God. And it's only by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what we must do to point them to the Savior so they could be reconciled with God, so they could become brothers and sisters in Christ and enter the family of God and become our brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's what we carry gospel track with you and pass them out all the time. Always be ready. And then number uh, four, piece of armor, is on verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, where we, you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So that is... The shield of faith is, is the fourth piece of armor. The believers continue to trust in God's word. And God's promises is necessary to protect him from all kinds of temptation and sin. Faith is the shield of temptation. And then number five is the, P, the fifth piece of armor, the helmet of salvation, Ephesians 6, 17. And take the helmet of salvation. That, 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 that could be talking about make sure you're safe. Make sure you have the assurance of your salvation. And by the way, if you trust in Christ our Savior, that's promised in the Bible. You don't have to doubt your salvation. That's from the devil. Stand on God's promises. So make sure you're saved, and then uh, make sure you have the assurance of your salvation, and make sure also that you have the assurance of trusting God's promise, and don't allow the devil to hit your head with doubt and with discouragement. Okay? And then number seven, which we studied last Wednesday night, the sixth piece of armor is on verse 17. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God that was last Wednesday, make sure you have a, a, a strong, healthy, daily relationship with this book. Remember what I said? This book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. So make sure you love this book, and you read it every day, you study it, and memorize it, and meditate on it, and, and obey it, and submit to it, and, and live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And that's the key. That's the key. And then tonight we're going to study the last piece of armor. It's found in Ephesians chapter 6 in verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the same. That's a mighty powerful weapon. Prayer. A very powerful weapon. Prayer, prayer is the power for victory. But not just any kind of prayer. Paul tells us how to pray if we want to defeat Satan. So we got to pray right. Not just any kind of prayer. And Paul's going to tell us here the right prayer to defeat Satan. Praying, notice what he says, praying always. There in Ephesians 6, 18, praying always. That's the frequency of prayer. Prayer should be constant. Prayer for the Christian is like the air we breathe. Not to pray is to hold your breath spiritually and the results are all bad. To be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. That's how important it is. Jesus said it's important. It's emphasized the importance of prayer. There's power in prayer. Jesus told us in Luke chapter 18, in verse 1, Jesus said that men are always to pray and not to faint. Jesus said it. Why he says that? Men are always to pray and not to faint. God knows that in the battle, when it gets hot, you and I could faint. You and I could get weary. You and I could give up. You and I could abandon the fight if you don't pray. You and I uh, 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 could abandon the fight if I stop praying, if I don't pray. You only have two alternatives. You either pray or faint. There's no middle ground. 
you either pray or faint. I don't want to faint. I want to be alert. I want to keep praying. I want to be a praying man. And God wants us to be praying people. So you're either, you either faint or you pray. I say this, and I like to quote it many times from John and Rice, all of our failures are prayer failures. You heard me say this over and over. I love, I love it. I love that quote. It's, it's biblical because it's true. All of our failures are prayer failures. John and Rice said that. By the way, he wrote, he wrote a whole book on prayer. You got to read that book of John and Rice. It's a powerful pamphlet, easy to read. And he said all of our failures are prayer failures. You heard me say this. No time to pray will make you an easy prey to the devil. No time to pray will make you an easy prey to the devil. The man who can kneel before God can stand before any man. A man who can kneel before God can stand before any man. No time to pray will set yourself for a fall during temptation. No time to pray will set you for a fall, for a stumble during temptation, when temptation comes to you. And um, Jesus said it in Matthew chapter 26, in verse 40. In Matthew 26, in verse 40, Jesus says, it says in Matthew 26, 40, and he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and said unto Peter, what? Could ye not watch with me one hour? What he's literally saying what? Jesus is shocked. What? You couldn't even spend one hour with me. And in, in verse 41, he says, watch and pray that you enter now into temptation. What am I saying? When you don't pray, you're setting yourself for a fall. You're going to fall into temptation. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. And that's why I believe Peter fell. And he fell big. And that's, how, that's why you and I will fall too. That's why we ought to be praying people. We're all going to get tempted. Temptations are always going to be, always going to be bombarded by temptation. But guess what? You, you, you're a praying woman. That's a shield for you in temptation. You will not fall. I will not fall. And uh, all of our failures are prayer failures. The average Christian, according to statistics, spend only one minute a day in prayer. And the average pastor only spend about five minutes in prayer. That's, that's sad. That is heartbreaking. Uh, think about it. That's what, according to statistics, the average Christian spend only one minute a day in prayer. Boy, and then the average pastor spend about five minutes. Boy, try to maintain a close relationship with anyone, talking to him only one minute a day or five minutes a day. See if that's going to be a healthy relationship. Well, that's how we do with God. And, and, and no wonder we don't, we, 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 we're defeated. We, God needs more time than that, than a minute or five minutes a day. And um, I believe Satan will attack your prayer life. He will attack your prayer life. The devil will attack my prayer life. He will attack your prayer life. And he's very, very successful because the average Christian prays about a minute a day, according to statistics. So he's been successful. And we're letting him defeat us and stop us and hinder us because uh, the devil will attack your prayer life. He did it. You know, he did it to Daniel. When you read Daniel chapter 10, Daniel was a praying warrior. And Daniel was praying to God in prayer. He was trying to get a hold of God. And in Daniel chapter 10, it tells us that the, the enemy, uh, 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 the devil, uh, using his demons, were attacking Daniel's prayer life. Daniel was trying to get a hold of God for God to answer his prayer. And then after 21 days that he was even fasting, Daniel was fasting and praying, praying and fasting, uh, always, without fainting, just like the Scripture tells us here. And in Daniel chapter 10, I mean, he was laboring in prayer, fervent prayer, and then after 21 days, God answered his prayer by sending one of his angels. And the angel came up to Daniel and touched him and said, Hey, your beloved, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, your prayer has been answered. And that even the, uh, uh, the angel told Daniel in Daniel chapter 10, he said, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, it's been a, a rough journey. He said, I, it wasn't easy to come here and give you this message. It took 21 days. I had, a, I had a, the king of Persia 
opposed me for 21 days. And that king of Persia could be referring to like uh, some kind of demon that has some kind of authority, that maybe a demonic lieutenant. And that demon had power. It has so much power that he even blocked the angel of God from bringing that prayer that it took 21 days. And, and, and then he says, he says, I got to go back and fight, and fight, fight this, uh, this enemy. So that just tells us how much power demons have even in our prayer life. They attack your prayer life. They did it to Daniel, they would do it to you and I. But Daniel did not give up. Bless God, he kept praying. And that's what we need to do. So, somebody say that, you know, it's a known fact that most people pray only when a problem arises. That is a known fact. Most people pray only when the problem arises. It's prayer. Somebody say that, is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? Which one is it? Prayer should be our steering wheel. I mean, what is the purpose of a steering wheel in your car? To control the direction of your vehicle, right? Well, guess what? Prayer should be our steering wheel. It should control every direction of our life. But what is a spare tire for? You only use it, right, when you got a flat tire. And, think, and you hope that you don't have to use it, right? So, but that's how many times we are. We just use prayer just when we're in crisis, when we have trouble. Like a spare tire when we have a flat. It shouldn't be that way. Prayer should be our steering wheel. We just should, should stay in touch with God all the time. In prayer, communicating with Him, because that's how you have an intimate, sweet hour of prayer, sweet relationship with the Lord. And that's what God wants from us. Look, statistics shows that only 11% of Christian couples pray together regularly. Think about that. Statistics show that only 11% of Christian couples pray together regularly. You heard the saying, a uh, 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 family that prays together stay together. Right? And you know what? Only 11% of Christian couples pray together regularly. But the divorce rate for those is 1 in 1,200. Think about that. The divorce rate for those Christians and a couple that pray together, it, the rate is those is 1 in 1,200. That's pretty astonishing, you know. Um, if we're going to defeat Satan, we need to pray always. We need the frequency of prayer. And this is emphasized over and over in the Bible. Jesus said it, Paul said it here in Ephesians 6, 18, pray always. Jesus emphasized the importance of it over and over in the scripture. Jesus said in Luke chapter 21, in verse 36, watch ye therefore and pray always. Jesus said it right in the beginning of that verse. Watch ye therefore and pray always. Sounds like the apostle Paul, while he's telling Ephesians 6, 18. The apostles said in Acts chapter 6, in verse 4, we will give ourselves continually to prayer. And of course, it says into the ministry of the word. No wonder God was blessing that church of Jerusalem. Flourishing. Why? You have people of prayer. We will give ourselves continually to prayer. Ephesians 6, 4. It was said of Cornelius. Of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. And the Bible introduces Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 as a devout man that feared God, and he prayed to God always. No wonder God answered his prayer. No wonder it touched God's heart. Because he was a man that feared God, devout, but he prayed to God always. Look, Jesus said it. Paul said it, that we need to pray always. Even the apostle Paul, not only said it in Ephesians 6, 12, 6, 18, but he reminds us again in Romans chapter 12, in verse 12. Continuing instant in prayer. In Colossians chapter 4, in verse 2, he says, continue in prayer. In Philippians chapter 4, in verse 6, he says, be careful for nothing. That means don't be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer. And then he, he said it again in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, in verse 17, pray without ceasing. You getting the idea? You getting the pattern here, the importance of praying always? And then Paul not only said it, he lived it. 
He didn't just say it. It's not just hot air. He, he put it to practice. He lived it. He was a man of prayer. He prayed always without ceasing. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 3, the apostle Paul say this. Uh, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 3, he says, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, he says, with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Think about it. He's, he's thanking the Lord that with pure conscience he remembered them in their prayers day and night. That's continual prayer. That's praying constantly without ceasing, without fainting. And he says, and that gives me a pure conscience. You want to have a pure conscience? Be a praying woman. Pray always, amen? That will give you a, a pure conscience. You, you, your prayer life is shallow, it stinks. That's not going to give you a pure conscience, but a guilty conscience. Amen? Because you know you're not close to the Lord, and you're, you're, you're not right with the Lord, and you know that your prayer life stinks, and that could be the reason. Because, again, all of our failures are prayer failures. So the idea is constancy. Is, is continually, is the frequency of prayer. Praying always means praying all the time. That's the thought. A Christian must pray always because he's always subject to temptations and attacks of the devil. A surprise attack has defeated many Christians who forgot to pray always. Praying fights the enemy. That's why we must take this prayer, uh, 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 this prayer life very seriously because praying fights the enemy. Jesus did it, and he don't need to pray because he's God. He's perfect, and he prayed to show us the pattern. In fact, his prayer life was so powerful that it impacted the disciple that he said, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. It impacted them because Jesus was a prayer warrior. He got up in the wee hours of the morning to the mountain, and he prayed all night at time. And he don't need to pray because he's God. He's not going to fall into temptation because he's God. He don't have a sinful nature. That's just to show you an example, the pattern that if you needed to pray, how much more you and I who are, who are sinful need to pray. So praying finds the enemy. Never are we more like Jesus on this earth than when we pray. You want to be like Jesus? Pray like he prayed. Be a praying man, a praying woman, pray always. You know, praying fights the enemy. Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4, tells us that Nehemiah fought the enemies through prayer. The enemies were trying to hinder Nehemiah from building God's work, trying to hinder the progress, the spiritual progress, and they kept at it, consistently attacking Nehemiah. And guess how Nehemiah defeated the enemy? Prayer. Consistent prayer, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4, listen to this. And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and more certain days, and fasted, and prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah fought the enemies through prayer. And if you want to fight the enemy, it's going to take prayer. There's no, there's no skipping those steps. There's no way around it. And uh, going back to Daniel, who was a praying warrior, he, Daniel also uh, uh, fought his uh, enemies through prayer. In fact, it was prayer that got him in trouble. Remember in the lion's den? Uh, uh, they, they, they told him not to pray, and then he said, no, I, in fact, he, that kind of, that kind of uh, 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 motivated him more to pray because what Nehemiah did, he went and he opened the windows of Jerusalem, he got on his knees, and three times a day, he opened the windows and he prayed to Jerusalem three times a day while he was on his knees. And because of that, because of prayer, he got in trouble and threw him in the lion's den, and it was prayer that got him out of the lion's den safely. So prayer got him in trouble. Prayer got him out of trouble. And guess what? Prayer is going to get you out of trouble. Prayer is going to get me out of trouble. So uh, Dio Moody, Dio Moody say this. He said, he who kneels the most stands the best. I like that. He who kneels the most Stand the bed, the power of prayer against Satan. Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. He knows that prayer will give you power to restrict the devil's power. He knows that. The devil doesn't want us praying because he knows that the power of prayer is greater than his power. He knows that. He often distracts us from praying simply by giving us all kinds of excuses not to pray. And we fall for the trap. 
We fall, or you say, well, I I'm kind of busy, my schedule, you can't afford not to pray. You better make that a priority. Amen? You better, you better, you better make that a priority because your day, I believe your day will go sweeter and, um, because that's how you're going to fight your battles in your knees, praying. And Satan knows that. He trembles when he sees God's people on their knees praying because he knows that's going to restrict his power. When a Christian misses fellowship with other Christians, the devil smiles. When a Christian stops reading his Bible, the devil laughs. When a Christian starts praying, the devil shouts for joy. He shouts for joy. Satan feels threatened whenever a Christian prays. The fact that the child of God is appealing to the Heavenly Father's help, it causes Satan to fear because I believe prayer moves the hand that moves the world. Amen? He knows that. He trembles when he sees us appealing to God in prayer, asking for his help. He knows that he's in trouble. He knows that. He trembles. Prayer brings the prayer and saying into the presence of Almighty God. Can you think about that, what prayer does? It brings me to the presence of Almighty God, the creator of the world. Can you imagine that? And we don't take advantage of that. People will, will drive miles, fly in an airplane, pay a lot of money to meet a, 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 a famous celebrity, maybe to take a picture with them. And we have the God of the universe that we could spend time anytime, anywhere in prayer, spend time in Almighty God's presence, and we don't take advantage of it. We don't take advantage of it. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 6, in verse 6, Jesus says, when thou prayer, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and thy father would see it in secret, shall reveal thee openly. That's pretty powerful. He sees you there in the closet. That means no distraction. Find a spot in your house, somewhere in your job, somewhere. Everybody got different time where you just shut the cell phone, no distraction, just you and God alone in sweet hour prayer. Amen? If it's an hour, it'll be a powerful hour because that's how you're going to fight the enemy. That's how you're going to win the battle. And that's how you're going to spend time in the presence of God Almighty. Because he says he sees you there. And he says, not only that, I'm going to reward you the openly. I'm going to bless you. Because prayer touches the heart of God. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Tell us, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. We have free access to go to God's presence. Come boldly. We're confident, that means, into the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to, uh, 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 grace to help in the time of need. When we pray, my friend, we get under the presence of God Almighty. That's pretty profound. Amen? That's pretty profound. And um, when we pray, you know what? We dress up in God's armor. You, that's part of the armor. That's the seven piece of armor. You got to put all of them on. Amen? You want to be victorious? You want to win the battle? You want the shield of God protection? Pray. Pray always. Amen? Because you're going to be dressed with the armor of God. And then you could quench all the fire darts of the wicked. You could stand against the evil day. Praying always. That's the frequency of prayer. To pray always does not mean to follow uh, ritualistic prayers or vain repetition or even formal prayers. I used to do that as a Catholic. I'm not a Catholic anymore. I'm a Bible believer. Amen? Matthew 6, 7, Jesus condemned those prayers, those repetition prayers. Not talking about that. Matthew 6, 7 condemns that kind of prayer that only the pagans and the heathens do. In Matthew 6, 7, Jesus says, but when you pray, use not the vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they should be heard for their much speaking. To pray always means to be in communion always with the Lord. It means that we live in constant awareness of God and His presence. It means that the Christian is ever reaching up towards God in prayer. That's what it means, amen? How many ever heard of the evangelist Billy Sunday? Some of you heard of Billy Sunday, right? Billy Sunday used to be a prayer warrior. He, he, he put this to practice. He was dressed in the armor of God. He was always praying always, fighting the enemy. And that's why he was victorious. 
And there's time that it was say when I read his biography, that sometimes he's walking with his wife. They're just walking in the park, and here he is, he's talking. He's moving his leg. His wife said, what? And she realized, it don't I hear, he's talking to God again. He's with his wife, and he's just talking to God, having a conversation with God. And that's what we need to do, amen? Hey, when you drive, talk to God, amen? People say, that, look at that person talking to himself. No, I'm talking to God, I'm not talking to myself. Say what you want, but I'll have to fellowship with God, amen? Hey, we had to do that, but make sure you got your eyes open, too, when you're driving, amen? Keep your eyes, keep your eyes on the road. I tell people sometimes when they call me and they say, can you pray for this? I don't say, I'll pray for you. I say, let's pray right now. Let's pray right now because I don't want to, you know, I'm forgetful, and I don't want to forget and be a liar. So if you ask me to pray, let's pray right now. And then I, I, I do that many times, and then if somebody's driving, I say, are you in the road? You're driving? I hear, like, the highway. Yeah, keep your eyes open as I pray for you. I'll close it, but you keep your eyes open. That's what it means, amen? That's what it means about praying always. Always communicating, talking with God. In all of our ways, acknowledge Him. Proverbs 3, 5, 6, right? In all of our ways, acknowledge Him. And He shall direct thy path. We got to include God in everything you do. Not just big problem. Every detail. Get God involved. Put God in it. Amen? That's what God wants. That's what he means, praying or praying about everything. Everything. One thing Pastor Gary left a mark on my, on my life is that. He prayed, but Gary, we got some witnesses here. He prayed about everything. We work together, let's pray. Let's thank the Lord for helping us. We had a bad day. We couldn't fix whatever, the, the angel or whatever. Let's thank the Lord. Amen. Praying always, amen. And he prayed always. He didn't give up. He didn't faint. Amen? So, that's what I mean, praying always. Notice what it says in verse 18, with prayer, with all prayer and supplication. That literally means all kinds of prayers. Pray for your pastor, amen? Pray for me as God, as I prepare messages. And God will give me the message, amen? I pray for you. I pray for you daily. I pray outside of this church. I pray for other, pray for other churches, sister churches. Pray for the missionaries. Pray for our president. The Bible says that we're supposed to pray for those who are in authority. Amen? That's biblical. I pray for President Biden every day. I pray for the, for the senators that, that represent New Jersey, that represent us all over the world. You know, I pray for, uh, for uh, 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 Mayor Kaba from, from Perth Amboy. I pray for him. You know, we suppose, that's biblical. The Bible says we're supposed to pray for those who are in authority. We pray about everything. I mean, pray, uh, uh, that's what it says. That's why we in everything by prayer. Pray for America. And then it says, with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. That means when God answers your prayer, thank God for it. Don't just pray until you get in trouble. Don't just pray until you get bad news about your health. Why don't you thank Him for good health now? Every day when I spend time in prayer, I, I, I spend minutes thanking God for blessings. Thank you for that I could see. I could hear. I don't have cancer. I, I, then I start praying for those who got cancer. Thank you that I don't have migraine headache. I pray for Brother George, and I pray for Will Hutchinson, two guys that I know that suffer from migraine headache. So I don't just wait until the problems upon me. I thank God that I'm doing pretty good, and God is blessing me. Amen? With thanksgiving. Be like the, don't be like those ten lepers that he healed ten. Only one came back with thanksgiving. And by the way, that one, uh, 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 I mean, he came with Jesus with a, uh, with so much earnesty that he wanted God to answer his prayer and heal him. He, he came and then um, I, after God heard him, he came back and he thanked the Lord right away. That leper. And that's what we need to do. With thanksgiving. Are you, great? Are you grateful? Are you, do you, you count his blessing and name them one by one every day? There's so many of them. With thanksgiving, be a grateful Christian. And then with praise too. I think we you add it to that thanksgiving with praise. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord how good he is for being who he is. Thank him for being omniscient, all-knowing, omnipotent, all-powerful, omnipresent, everywhere at one time, immutable, never changes. Thank him for his kindness and his mercy that I knew every morning. Thank him that he's, he's perfect, he's all-powerful, and he's your shield and my shield. Thank him. Praise him, amen? How great thou art, Lord. Lord, you're, 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 you're powerful, Lord. You're awesome. You're holy. You're all-knowing, Lord. You never make a mistake. Praise him. That's part of Thanksgiving. 
in your prayer time, thank them. And then also do it with confession too. Make sure you confess sin. Because the Bible tells us clearly that sin could hinder prayer. The Bible tells us in Psalm 66 verse 18, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 59 in verse 2, But your iniquities have separated you between you and your God. And your sin hath hid his face from you that he will not hear. You know what? Make sure you come clean with the Lord. Confess sin, amen? By the way, you, you, you commit them one by one, confess them one by one. Amen? That's what we need to do. The Bible tells us in 1 John 1, 9, that he is faithful and just to forgive. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive our sin and to cleanse us from all our own righteousness. But we've got to confess those sins. We must do that. You know that a uh, 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 sin could hinder our prayer life? You know that a poor a poor husband and wife relationship could hinder prayer. A poor husband and wife relationship will hinder prayer. I read to you from First Peter chapter three verse seven. First Peter chapter three verse seven. It says, "Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered." That's pretty clear right there. So the husband needs to live with his wife according to knowledge, which I believe it means living with your wife wisely, giving her love, honor, courtesy, and understanding. Realize that she is the weaker vessel. That doesn't mean we're better than them. That means weaker vessel. And as far as in the, in the physical, man, the average woman is weaker than the man physically. Amen? You know, it's true. You know, and, and you know what? And, and I think in that area, we need to, to help them out and give them the special help they need. They need a job done in their house. They need to put, put the ceiling lamp. Hey, put it on for her. Amen? I mean, they need a, 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 for you to set up the coffee table she got from Amazon. Put it on for her. She needs a, a kitchen table. Hey, put it together. Amen? I mean, do it for her. Put the window blinds. Grab a ladder. Do it for her. That's man's job, amen? Do it. And she wants to put a heavy mirror on the wall and weighs 50 pounds, put it for her. Amen? Make sure you use the right anchors, amen, on the wall. And then, you know, I mean, uh, uh, if she wants to move furniture around, do it for her. She's the weaker vessel, amen? That's a good husband. Amen? Amen? And then it says, as being heirs together of the grace of life. Your wife is the mother of your children. She is the queen of your home. She keeps the house clean. I'm thankful for a wife that keeps the house super clean. Thank God for a clean wife. Amen. She's very clean. Very clean. I got to take my shoes off when I get home. Very clean, my wife. And I appreciate that she got it from her mom. And now my daughter's doing it. My granddaughter's going to pick it up. Amen? I know there's some woman not saying amen to that. Huh? Why? And then she is your partner and friend for life. Then we're supposed to treat her accordingly. If we don't treat them with honor, like the Bible says, our prayers will be hindered. I didn't say it. Peter said it. Our prayers will be hindered. Look what he says again, 1 Peter 3, 7. Likewise, you husband dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. You know what else? Jesus warned us that when we cannot pray effectively if we have not forgiven others who have hurt us. You know Jesus said that? Because the enemy wants us to say bitter and unforgiving towards others. Let me read it to you. Mark chapter 11, verse 25 and 26. Jesus said it. Mark 11, verse 25 and 26. And when you stand praying... Forgive. If you have out against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. So that's a warning from Christ. If you want to pray effectively, forgive others who have hurt you. Don't be bitter. Let it go, amen? Let it go. Just God, God let it go with you. Let it go. So notice in Ephesians 6.18, it says there, 
prayer and supplication in the spirit. Notice that. In the spirit. It must be done in the spirit. And I think of the book of little Jude. Jude chapter 1 verse 20. It tells us praying in the Holy Ghost. Just that phrase. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Jude, Jude chapter 1 verse 20. What does that mean praying? Not just any prayer because you could pray in the flesh. Praying in the spirit. What does that mean? And then praying in the Holy Ghost. Same thing. I think it's honest praying. When you are playing in the spirit, you're honest praying. You're being transparent with God. You're coming clean with God. You're confessing sin. You're not trying to handle the rug. You're telling God your real struggles, your real sins. That's praying in the spirit. You can't hide anything from God. Come clean with him. That's what it means, praying in the spirit. And then it says in Ephesians 6, 18, we must be alert in our prayer. It says, watching there unto. That means keeping on the alert. Stay away. Ever watchful for opportunities to pray and watching for things that will hinder prayer. Always aware of the needs of others, listening to other people's needs and keep them in prayer. Be, be aware of your surroundings. Listen to people's prayer needs. That's why when I was there, before I was a pastor and I was sitting there, Pastor Gary was the parent, guess what I did? I took everybody's prayer request. Not just one. I wrote everybody's prayer request and I've been doing it since. Amen? Pastor Garrett, I take everybody's prayer request and I pray for them. But I did that before I was the pastor. I was doing it while I was sitting there. Because you know what? The needs, I see the need and I'm, I want to be alert. And I want to, I want to help my brother and sister to pray for that need. It's quiet tonight. Amen. Maybe I'm stepping some toes tonight. And then it says we must be active in our prayers. Verse 18, with all perseverance. Keep praying until the answer comes. Keep praying from, until the answers come from God. Just like Jacob in Genesis 32, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. God only gives three answers to prayer. Three answers to prayer God gives. The first one is yes. We like that one, right? The second one is not yet. The third one is I have something better. That, yes, not yet, or I have something better. I know we like the yes, right? Prayer is the key that unlocks all doors. And then he says in verse 18, and supplication for all saints. Pray for all saints. We are in the battle. We're not in the battle alone. All around us are other Christians who are struggling and fighting the devil too. Our duty is to be in prayer for one another. Why? We're in the same team here. We are pulling the same road. We are fighting the same enemy. We are fighting the same spiritual warfare, my friend. Go to, go to one more verse. Go to the last verse. Go to James, Job chapter 42 for a minute. Job chapter 42, look in verse 10. Job chapter 42, verse 10. Look what it says. Job 42, verse 10. It says, this is the last chapter of the book of Job, verse 10. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. You know what I got out of that? The Bible released Job from the attacks of the devil right there. And God gave him twice more. When Job began to focus more on the needs of others, he began to pray for his friends. Many times we focus in our prayer. Our prayer is like selfish. It's all about us. How about others? How about putting yourself last and start praying for others? Maybe God will begin to turn the captivity on you, and God will begin to release the attacks of the devil, and God begin to bless you because God said this person is more concerned about other people's needs than their own needs. Amen? That's, that's powerful prayer. That's effective prayer. James talks about that in James chapter 4. In verse 3, you ask, you ask and receive not because you ask and miss that you may consume it upon your own love. That's selfish prayer. That's selfish prayer. Avoid foolish praying, wrong praying with wrong motive. Avoid selfish praying. Look, if God gave you everything you ever asked for, you'd be a mess today. I'll be a mess. Thank God for that. He knows what's best. Amen? You know what we need to do? Lord, teach us to pray. Let's be honest. Our prayer life stinks. It's shallow. Come on now. Let's be honest. We're so busy running around, we ain't got time to pray. No wonder we don't have the joy of the Lord. And that's what we need to have the armor of God. Let's stand on our feet. Ephesians 6, 18. Praying always. We don't pray in supplication. That's what we need. Janelle, go ahead and play the music. You know what you need to do.